Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Father, I count it a privilege to stand in this sacred desk. I'm asking you to anoint these lips of clay. Let me speak as your oracles. Don't let me say anything you're not saying. But let me speak everything that the Holy Spirit is wanting us to bring to the hearts of the people. Anoint us to speak, but anoint us to hear what the Spirit of God is saying in this hour. I promise you to give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for what you accomplish in us and through us today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is the sword of the Spirit? It is the Word of God. Now turn right to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Probably everybody here could quote it. Sometimes we quote Scripture and it becomes just a, a routine thing or just a calisthenic, and we forget what it really says. Verse 12 says, For the Word of God is quick, it's alive, and powerful, and sharper than any, than any two-edged sword. What is the Word of God? Quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest or anything hid from him in his sight, but all things, are naked and open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do or to give an account. I want to talk to you today on this thought, the sword of the Spirit. You know, there is uh, such a discount on the Holy Ghost. You know, whether take it or leave it, or whether Pentecost believes it anymore, whatever. But I, I have been around long enough to see the games and all of what goes on in religion. And I can tell you everything that this great book warns us of, of the fallacies, the deceptions, the everything that will take the church off the track or derail it is always going to be, the first thing is going to be is a discount of the Holy Ghost. When you discount the Holy Ghost, you're on a road of deception. I don't care how intelligent or who the commentator you're reading. If there's a discount on what happened in that upper room on the day of Pentecost, and you want to view it some other way, you're on your way to being deceived. The searching power of the Holy Spirit for the fiery sword is a heart-searching weapon and as well as a sin-destroying power. It must be, saints, in our pulpits across America in this hour. The Word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any, than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And, and neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. No wonder the devil doesn't want us to have the power of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Ghost in our church, in our preaching, in what we teach, preach, and live, because it does this very thing. It digs us up. It reveals the hidden things of the heart. We have never needed a, the gift of the Holy Ghost more than we do right now. I'm telling you, if ever, 
You have been filled, and you need to be refilled every day of your life. Without the Holy Ghost, church, the masses are being deceived. And we cannot discern unless we're filled with the Holy Ghost. The ability to discern the emotions of people and the works and the calisthenics, the wittiness of the pulpit today can deceive us by some kind of an outward act of some kind of deception only only, only the Holy Ghost will discern between the intents and the thoughts of the heart. We have today, because of the threat of terrorism, the most sophisticated metal detectors that search our bodies and our luggage to find the smallest possible weapon that could do you and I harm. But church, there is nothing more sophisticated than the Holy Ghost as He passes through every portion of our being. And when He comes to anything that's wrong in our life, there's an immediate resistance. And as He passes through His hand upon it, there is intense pain. About the time you think you're perfected, you'll find that this wonderful Holy Ghost will turn up something in your life and mine, not because He's mad at us, not because He's disappointed in us, but because it's going on to perfection. It's going on to be more Christ-like. Everything that He deals with in that life is not because He's upset at us or mad at us. It's to reveal the hidden secrets of our heart. The sword of the Spirit is searching out the evil and He's commanding it to declare itself. The greatest hindrance of our spiritual life and progress is found in the disguise of our enemy and the deception of our own nature. My God, hear me. The evil cannot be crucified until it is recognized, diagnosed, and brought into light and delivered over to death to reckon it dead indeed. Self, church, can dress itself up into so many disguises that nothing but the piercing sword of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures can force it to take its true place and admit its evil character. I can tell you, in most churches, you can rob a bank, a liquor store, get drunk Saturday, come to church, and feel absolutely no conviction whatsoever. No matter what they sing, what they preach, how they shake your hand or hug your neck. Let me tell you something. The church cannot survive without the baptism, without the conviction of the Holy Ghost. He's a holy God. And I'm not trying to put demands on the people of God that He Himself doesn't put or give us the power to overcome. The discerning of the Holy Spirit is only to purge and to purify that church for the rapture. The next prophetic event on the calendar is the rapture of the church. There can be a thousand things still happen. But I can tell you, church, look up. Our redemption is drawing nigh. The king is coming. And it's not Elvis Presley. It's not Michael Jackson. It's not Paul's TV. It is Jesus of Nazareth. The king is coming. And he's coming for a church without a spot, without a wrinkle. The Holy Spirit searches out our sins and He finds sin in many places where our own self-complacency would have never suspected it. See, years ago, when Brother Clendenin would come preach at my church, I used to think, I'm not going to have him back. Because about the time I think I'm perfected, about the time I pray more than I've ever prayed. Read more chapters than I've ever read. 
I do more calisthenics of religion than I've ever done. He comes in and messes everything up. And he would leave, and I'd think, I need to resign. Why do I even pastor? About the time I think I'm perfected, here comes Brother Clinton and to mess it all up. But saints of God, I learned, sitting on the front row, God said to me, Son, I see you, I see my church. When I see you, I see my son. I see things that are not my son. And the preaching and the anointing of the Holy Ghost is to dig out of you what's not Christ-like. It's the perfecting of the church. Why would you be upset? Why would you not want him back? He's only getting the church ready for the rapture. Why would it so upset you that God found something in you that you didn't know was there? It ought to thrill our heart that there is such a holy God that he won't allow it in my life. But he loves me so much, he will stop and hover. Was it Haggai or was it Malachi said, he would come as a refiner's fire and a fuller soap and he would set. Hallelujah. He would set. That means he's not going nowhere. I'll set and I'll refine. I'll purge. I'll purify my church. Hallelujah. 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 Oh God. Not only does he detect and condemn the grosser forms of immorality and disobedience and deal directly with the Ten Commandments and that law of righteousness. But this Holy Spirit, He also brings us face to face with the law of love. That law of love, look at this. That Old Testament was love your neighbor as you love yourself, conditional. But Jesus tells us in the New Testament, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The Old Testament put you and I at the center. But the New Testament puts Christ at the center. If you love me, the law of love will govern your life. This law of love shows us that even an unkindly thought is murder. 1 John 3, 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You don't have to kill your brother. Hate him in your heart. Hug him and tell him you love him, you liar. Why? He said the law of love is that an unkind, an unkind thought about a brother, a sister that belongs to the family of God. He said it's murder. What's this Holy Ghost? Oh, I thank God for him. And this law of love shows us that an unforgiving spirit is an unpardonable sin. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, God will not forgive you how many people bound with bitterness and unforgiveness live in our prayer lines when the only prayer God's going to hear is forgive your brother your sister but preacher you don't know what they did to me I may not but I know what you and I did to him hallelujah This law of love is living a life of selfishness is rebellion against God. 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness as a sin of idolatry. Think about it, saints. A selfish motive, even in the holiest act, 
is a soul defiling sin. What do you mean, preacher? I mean when you go to church to find you a mate, that's a soul-defiling sin. There's some people go to church to try to find a business deal with somebody they can sell a house to or carpet or some other kind of business deal. The only reason they go to church, they'll lift their hands. They'll go through all the acts outwardly. But this Holy Ghost, the sword of the Spirit, knows if it's a soul-defiling sin that it's not pure from the heart. The Holy Ghost knows if you sing in the choir to be seen. Or you only go to church to show off your talent. The minute the pastor touches the talent, you quit church and God. Why? Because it only proves there's a selfishness there. In honor, prefer your brother. A selfish motive then can be a holy act, but yet soul defiling. He brings you and I face to face, saints, with the law of faith. And he shows us that to doubt God is a crime. Oh, God. Nobody, nobody has sought harder these last two years to say, Oh, God, I don't want to preach just to preach. I don't want to say what you are, who you are, what you can do if I don't believe it. I can't be another religious camp meeting. I must come to tell you, he's God this morning, and he still saves, he still heals, he still delivers, he still fills with the Holy Ghost. He's God. To treasure an anxious care, even about tomorrow, is wickedness. To pray in unbelief is to take the name of God in vain. What am I talking about? The law of love. The law of faith. He then adds, whatever is not of faith is sin. What did he say? When I come back, Will I find faith on this earth? It's not a confession. It's not some kind of take some promise out of the book and try to convince yourself that you believe it. If you believe that book, you'll walk that book. You'll live that book. You'll trust the author of that book. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit takes us through the very realm of truth and of error. And he gives us discernment to detect the faults. And he gives us Christ's own weapon against Satan's lies. Satan, it is written. It is written. It is written. Get ready, church. The church is about to get tested on everything we teach, everything we preach, everything we talk about. We're getting ready to have to face it and to live it. Are you willing to die for what you believe? Or are you going to fold up and quit preaching it because they're going to arrest you? Are we going to stand... Can I tell you from this side to that, every trial, every test, every storm was to prepare us for it. This man of God said last night at dinner, the position when things change, times change, and you get to a certain place, whatever that event is, a position changes. And that position changes. Can I tell you the church is being positioned in this final hour. We're going to find out 
Is he the same God that spoke to a Red Sea? Is he the same God that fed the multitudes with a boy's lunch? We're going to get to find out that what we preach, is he still the same God? Every trial, every test is to bring you and I to a place to wait on him until he shows up to prove he's the God we talk about. Then when we step into this great desk, it's the sword of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. I don't want to waste my time with just somebody preaching. I want a man anointed of the Holy Ghost. I've been in religion too long. I can outsmart him. I can outcon him. I can outtrick him. I don't need it. I need the Holy Ghost. I need him to go back to the 10th row, the 20th row, and reach in and tell Duke Downs, there's something there, boy, that you've had hid. And I want it out. He discerns between the false peace and a true peace. He discerns an earthly joy and an incorruptible joy. Oh my. See, he's a discerner. That's why we get uncomfortable around Holy Ghost filled people. We used to call my dad Holy Ghost eyes. Because when he'd look at you, he didn't look at Duke, he looked right through you. He'd just look at you. Where you been, boy? Uh, down at the park playing ball. Where else? He just staring a hole through me. I'd get so nervous. When he'd preach, I'd think, you've got a hundred people. Preach to them. Leave me alone. <laughs> Haven't you had people tell you, why do you look at me every time you preach? <laughs> I said, I don't. I'm trying to think of something to say. I'm not looking at you. I'm looking to God to tell me what to say. It's the Holy Ghost that tells you there's something He's trying to show you. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. He'll discern the love that's a natural instinct and a love that is Christ's love. A love that never faileth. Never faileth. Where'd you get that? That's Christ's love. It'll discern the zeal of a Jehu that is nothing but a selfish passion and a holy zeal that burns strongly even when no man approves of you. You can stand firmly even if the cost is your very life. You have to know by the power of the Spirit, it's a wonderful thing when people say what a great message, what a good preacher, whatever, you appreciate it, and you know you do, we all do, but you have to be just as strong if they said, I hate everything you said. Why? I've got to please God. I've got to please God. And it has to be a love that goes beyond what's governed by pleasing men or people. He discerns, church, between the false and the true worship. He discerns the prayer that is prompted by the Holy Spirit to the Father who seeth in secret. And he discerns the religious emotion that's kindled in a carnal nature by some eloquent sermon or some sad story or some pathetic appeal or a song that brings tears to the eyes while a heart is as hard as a stone towards God and fellow man. He discerns the difference that's why, saints, we wonder on Sunday morning, they'll flood our altars with tears and you don't see them again. Why? They come on an emotion. They come for a Christ without a cross. 
When you get a Christ without a cross, you've got a mess on your hands. You must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. That's the only answer to the church. You say, that sounds so hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. It's the easiest thing you're ever going to do when you surrender all to Jesus Christ. Whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you're longing for in my life, I yield it to you. I beg you, he said, give me your body. A living sacrifice. He shows us the difference between true and false submission and the weakness that yields to sickness and Satan. He shows us. This ain't humbleness. You're a wimp. Sometimes, see, we try to act humble in our submission when sometimes trying to act humble in our submission is a weakness that Satan picks up on. I'm not talking about going around strutting. I'm not talking about going around in arrogance. I'm just talking about walking around full of the Holy Ghost. And if he tells you, you stand. You've done all to stand. You stand. Don't you back an inch. I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night. When I got done Sunday morning, some people said, somebody told him everything and we're leaving the church. You hearing me, saints? Only... The Holy Ghost knew what was hid in that heart. If I went to church wimping around, worried about somebody's feelings, I may have built a bigger church, got more money in the bucket, but I'd have had more tears in the church. So he knows... Are you whipping because you're afraid to confront? Or has he told you to humble yourself and let him air it out? You just step back and let God be God. In your humbleness, he'll be made strong. In your strength, he'll be made stronger. You just have to know, I have to know, this is the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's a sword of the Spirit. On the other hand, the true patience and the loving, lovingly bows to the will of God and refuses the weights and the adversary would put upon us, casting all your care on Him. For He careth for you. What are you doing carrying it? Jesus said, Ought not this woman to be loosed? How far was he from her when he said it? She's never stood up. She's bent double. He said, ought not this woman to be loose? In other words, woman, loose yourself. Get up from there as she begins to try to straighten out because the master said, ought not you to be loosed? He walks over to her and lays hands on her and heals her. But there was something about ought not she to be loosed from that infirmity. I think we carry infirmities, calling it humbleness. I think we carry things around that are bigger than us and harder to carry than we should be carrying that we ought to cast it over on Him and let Him carry it. He told us, cast your ever care upon me, for I care for you. Give it all to Him. Church, He leads us to pray with the psalmist, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see. Know my thoughts. See, is there any wicked way in me? Lead me in the way everlasting. The Holy Spirit, church, possesses a consecrated heart, wants nothing for you and I but the highest life, and He watches us with a sensitive and even a jealous love. No, I'm not talking about this carnal trash, a champion in you and all this nonsense. I'm talking about God looks at His church, and He says, you go on to perfection. 
Christ is that perfection. And Christ will enable you and I to do, to be, to say, to go, to sin, to reach, to do everything He asks and requires of us. He, Christ, will enable and will give us the grace to do it. But He watches over you and I. Why? He wants the best for our life. He wants us to go on to perfection. And He watches you and I with a jealous love. James said in 4 and 5, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain that the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Meaning, the Spirit that dwelleth in us loveth us to jealousy. I've heard this man of God say it more than once. You can get away with a lot of things. Brother Clendenin will say that. Say things about me. Attack me. May even smack me around a little bit. But don't you touch my wife. Don't you touch my bride. That's what he'll say. No matter what his age is, or what his feebleness might be, he's going to stand up. Why? There's a jealous love there for that bride. And what he's saying is, don't you mess with her. She's mine. How much more does this Holy Ghost watch over the bride, the church, the body of Christ with a jealous love that said, how dare you talk about Jerry? How dare you get in their living room? How dare you sow discord in that choir? How dare you cause trouble with an usher? How dare you talk about that church? This is a jealous love. I'm guarding my church. And it's my church you're messing and with see that's why when somebody comes to talk to us about the body of Christ about a brother or sister in the Lord we better take a second look we better stop for a minute wait a minute if he's looking over this with a jealous love he might smack me upside the head for this I don't want to go through what I've been through over some of the things I've said some of the ways I've acted I don't, Casey, once is enough. One good whooping for my daddy was plenty for me. That would last me a year if I didn't get caught again. I'm telling you, I never needed more than one good whooping for my daddy because he'd leave marks. He'd be in jail today for how he disciplined us. But I can tell you, at 60 years old, if he walked in, I'd sit down and say, Daddy, here, you take this microphone. Because I have a respect for that man of God. Not only as daddy, but as a man of God. And God looks over his church with a jealous love. I'm going somewhere in a minute with this that's going to help us in, in this final hour how bad we need it. The heart of the Holy Ghost is intensely concerned in preserving us from every stain and every blemish and bringing you and I into God's perfect will for our life. Church, this is what conviction is and does. Don't lose it. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. You wonder why he's turned up the heat. That when you look at somebody wrong, you start to tell some kind of gossip or some kind of a story, and he stops you, and you try to tell it again, and he stops you. He used to let you get away with it. But now he's turned up the heat. Don't say that. Don't treat them that way. Don't walk around strutting like a banny rooster. You're be humbled, or I'll humble you. You don't act that way. He's bringing a conviction, saints of God. Let him do it. Cherish it. All you need to do is walk one week without the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. And everything I'm telling you, you would say, Oh God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I look for church after church after church trying to find a Pentecostal church. When my dad died, when my dad died, I thought God died. I backslid. I left God. I left the 
church. But when I tried to find one, I went to probably 30, 40 Pentecostal churches. I'd sit through a service. I'd tell my wife, the Holy Ghost is not here. There's no conviction. There's no stir of the Spirit. Brother Condit and I look for it like a man starving to death. Why? I knew wherever I get, Brother Shoots, that the conviction's there. God's there. And if God will convict me, God will deliver me. He's not playing some little religious game with us. Uh Uh-uh. Not when he's going to call this church out of here. And we're going to walk on streets of gold. We're going to walk where we wanted to walk. Our entire walk of God. Everything we've heard, preached, taught, lived. Every trial, every test. Everything we have faced and come through and gone through will be wiped away in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The Holy Ghost loves us too much to leave us in the mess we're in. That heavenly bridegroom will have his church not only free from every spot, but also from every wrinkle and any such thing. That spot, church, is a mark of sin. But the wrinkle is a sign of weakness, age, and decay. He, God, by His Spirit, wants no such defacing touch upon the holy features of His saints. You know, you don't spend all your time trying to run that church for your retirement. Because the day you started trying to conform it all to your retirement, you retired. And now every person that comes, you're going to gear it You're going to change it. You're going to alter it because he may put money towards my retirement. And there's a weakness there. There's age there. There's decay there. I've learned, church, obey God. Obey the Holy Ghost. He's not bankrupt. If he wants you to retire, he's got plenty in his retirement account. You can trust him. Give, as we heard the man of God say. God's a giver. He said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Church, the Holy Ghost is the executor of the will of God, who he sends to call to separate and to bring home his bride is jealously concerned in fulfilling in us all this master's will. This is why he's ever searching us through and through with more and more tenderness, finding every hidden fault, preparing us for the marriage of the Lamb. Tenderness. As he hovers, he sits as a refiner's fire. He's not going nowhere. He's going to stay put and deal with everything in my life and yours. And I've learned it's not so much. Oh God, what are you doing in this camp meeting? Who are you going to deal with this year? No sir. God, begin with me. Start with me. As Brother Clinton said last night at dinner, I don't care what I've said, what I've done, where I've gone. I may have made mistakes. I may have missed the will of God. All All I ask for is, oh God, find me with a pure heart. Is a man's heart pure? Humans are going to make mistakes. Get ahead of God. Miss God. Turn left when we should have went straight. Say things we wish we wouldn't have said. We have a treasure in an earthen vessel. But is a heart pure? We judge people by a lot of things and never by a pure heart. I preached Sunday morning. I won't re-preach it. But I preached a message on have you ever been hurt? And I used Peter and Malchus. If Malchus would have judged the church by Peter, Jesus could have never touched him or healed him. He'd have never let him touch him. 
He just said, don't you touch me. Because if this is what the church is, I don't want nothing to do with you. Peter couldn't heal him, and Peter wouldn't heal him. Peter took his ear off, really going for his head. Was Peter a good man? Absolutely. Jesus said, if you don't have a sword, get one. He literally took him. As I need to go get a sword. He went and bought one. Why have one if you're not going to use it? And if you're going to mess with my Jesus, I'll take your head off. That ought to be logical. God ought to have honored that. No, sir. Jesus said, he walks over, picks up the ear, and puts it back on Malchus. And Malchus could have said, don't touch me. The church is horrible. All you do is teach them to cut off ears. No, sir. Was Peter's heart pure? Absolutely. He just thought he's doing the right thing. But he didn't know what Jesus knew. And what you and I forget, I can't heal you if I wanted to. Only Jesus can heal you. I said only Jesus can heal you. And if Malchus doesn't let Jesus heal him, what a tragedy it would have been. Are you hearing me? The Holy Ghost is God's executive, not only for the salvation of the church and the sanctification of His people, but for the conviction of sinners and the judgment of wicked men and the destruction of the enemies of God and the final punishment of the devil and his angels. Church, this sword is God's weapon for slaying the proud and the willful sinner and laying them at the feet of mercy. I've heard Brother Clinton say it all my preaching life, 17 years anyway. You never get a man saved till you get him lost. Today we never get him lost, and we're trying to save him. You have to know that he that's forgiven much loveth much. What he's forgiven me of, I shouldn't be preaching. I shouldn't be a preacher. I shouldn't be a pastor. There's no way I qualify. But because of the mercy and the grace of God that He would reach down and purge and purify and wash me in the blood of the Lamb and declare me sinless, it called me to preach. I had to know that I need a Savior. I had to know how low can a man get that he'd walk in a courtroom and say, you let Duke Downs go free. I took his charge. This sword is God's weapon for slaying the proud and the willful sinner. We can entertain, we can interest men, but saints, only the Holy Ghost can convict them of sin and pierce them to the heart with a deep and a soul-saving conviction. The Holy Ghost bears this mighty sword and He uses it through His Holy Word to break a sinner's heart and to bring us or them to the feet of Jesus. The Holy Ghost is also God's mighty hand to avenge His people. Hear me now for a little bit. Against the wicked and punish those who disobey Him or harm His people. If we... Be willing and obedient. We'll eat the good of the land. But if we refuse and rebel, we shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. Church, the same power that struck down Ananias and Sapphira in, is still in, that was in the early church is still in the church still moving in this world. And wherever God's presence is, there you will find His judgments are still being made known. It's a solemn thing to take lightly the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you by the Spirit of God that as you stay true to God, don't vindicate yourself. Don't avenge yourself. He'll take care of it. It's His church. Some people have tore your church apart and it looks like they got away with it. No, they didn't. 
They've gone on a year, two, three, four, whatever, and it looks like 20 years. They've gotten by with it. God said to tell you, in this closing hour, He's going to move swiftly in His judgment on those that have wreaked havoc to His church. He said to tell you, don't you rejoice in their calamity. God will vindicate you. Don't you do it. He's moving very swiftly. He's going to re retaliate and repay those that have sown horrible dissension and discord, tore your reputation apart, tore everything in that church apart, and it looks like they got away with it. It looks like Satan's power was greater and stronger than God's. No, sir, brother. All of that work, all of that dealing is God's trying to see. Would you quit preaching? Will you quit pastoring? Mr. Big Bucks left you. That one left you. Did you keep going? Did you keep doing my will? I'll vindicate you. I'll avenge you. The most scary words you'll ever hear or read out of this book is vengeance is mine. Say it, God, I will read. Pay. I'm telling you, church, God will repay. I've watched it in these last few months, so I'm trying to tell you to prepare you. You're going to see an unbelievable amount of God's judgment begin to sweep those and upon those that it looks like they got away with it. No, they didn't. But don't you react in some kind of rejoicing in their calamity. No, sir. If anything, beg God to have mercy on them. <clears throat> it's a solemn thing to take lightly the Holy Ghost. I've got to tell this. It keeps coming. Had a man sitting in my church, came in a drug addict, got delivered and set free from drugs, called to preach. I'm telling you, Brother Clendenin knows him like he knows me. This young man was a man on fire for God. Every camp meeting that Brother Clendenin was there, he had worked those altars, dripping wet, looked like he fell in a pool, soaking wet, sopping wet, praying people through to the Holy Ghost in that altar. But he began to get caught up in his own self, in his own little theology, in his own little degree. And he sat through a little prayer meeting here and there, and with his arms folded, began to tell people in the church, can you believe we got a pastor that won't let others preach in that church? Church, that's not true, but that's what he began to tell. I'm going to go out and start my own. And he strutted, went on the radio, went on television, he put on a show. And every time you see him, it's so-and-so's ministries. A year or two has gone by. Actually, about five. I never said a word. Just straight ahead. Every time I'd see him, I'd hug him and love him. I was at a wedding about two months ago. He showed up at that wedding. Come and knelt down next to me. His whole appearance was not even the same. Looked like a different person. Talked to me for probably 15 minutes. He jumped up to leave, and my wife said to me, Who is that? I said, You don't know? No. I said, That's so-and-so. You're kidding me. I said, That's him. She said, He's dirty. I said, Dirty? And she said, Yes. The Holy Ghost said, He's dirty. Three weeks later to the day, he was drunk and died in a car crash. He's in hell. Vengeance is mine. I didn't wish this on him. It tore my heart out. I don't need to vindicate me. God will vindicate you, sir. God will vindicate you, ma'am. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I don't have time to go on and on. But what I'm trying to tell you, it's swift. And it's coming. He is the author of human life. And he, the Holy Ghost, in a split second, can take it away. Deuteronomy 32, 41 said, If I wet my glittering sword, and I met mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and I will reward them that hate me. 
2 Chronicles 32, 14 says, Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed, that could deliver his people out of mine hand, that your God should be able to deliver you out of mine hand? This is a true and scary word. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Thessalonians 4, 6 says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified, defraud means to take advantage of another. Saints, you and I do not want to have an orphan, ch orphan children and widowed wives cry out against us to God. Church, we do not want to have the little hands of wronged and innocent children pleading to heaven for our punishment. We don't want to meet that awful sentence that after a life of reckless evil speaking against the servants of God, Touch not my anointed, neither do my prophets no harm. It would be better to play with lightning than to mess with one of God's kids. It would be better to take the electric wires in your hands and a fiery current than to speak a reckless word against a servant of Jesus Christ or recklessly repeat a slanderous darts which thousands of Christians are hurling on others to the hurt of their own souls and bodies. We may wonder why some sicknesses are not healed, why some are not filled with the joy of the Holy Ghost, or why we're not blessed or prosperous. It may be that some fiery dart that was flung with an angry voice or in an idle hour of thoughtless gossip is pursuing us on its returning way as it describes a circle which always brings back to the source from which it came. I don't care what you've said about a preacher, a church, a church member. If it was a dart in gossip, an idle word, and you hurled it out there, it only has one place to go. That's a full circle. And it's coming back. Some people, it may be weeks, months, or years, but it's coming back. It was a thoughtless dart that was flung. Every seed of bitterness sown. Every idle and evil word will come back to its source. Jesus said, I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Let us remember, church, that when we persecute or hurt His children of God, we are but persecuting Him and hurting ourselves far more. And the greatest hindrances to revival is gossip. Bitterness, unforgiveness, idle words that maybe didn't have a true attack in, in its mode, but the people you told was immature enough to mishandle it. And away they went to destroy the people of God. The roadside of America is littered with damaged Pentecostals. Littered with thousands of people because somebody's idle gossip and tailbearing, bitterness and unforgiveness, angry. Every time you meet them, all they talk about is who hurt them, and who did this to them, who did that to them. The child of God, if He never vindicates you on this side of the rapture, you have to get the victory. You have to let it go. You have to give them to God. Quit spreading it. Quit harboring it. Quit holding it. It's God's. 
Let him have it. You go on. Christ suffered the same way. He suffered every attack you've ever had. Everything you face, Christ faced it with the victory. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's where we're going to end up if you will endure it. i got to close. Oh, God, help me. Help me. There is an hour and a day coming in which the Lord Himself in His sore and great strong sword will punish Levathon, an evil system. And I think that's the system that Brother Schutz alluded to this morning. He said in Isaiah 27, 1, In that day the Lord with His sore and great and strong sword shall punish Levathon, the piercing serpent, even Levathon, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Then even Satan himself, saints, shall feel the sharp and the fiery force of that flaming sword that he seen, that he saw for the first time as he was led out of that Garden of Eden. When he looked back at Eden's gate with a fearful crime of man's destruction upon Satan's head and a curse which that fiery sword is yet to execute. That hour is not fully come. But thank God, the Holy, blessed Holy Spirit is still here to resist and to overcome the power of the destroyer. He was Christ's strength in His time of defense, in the conflict in the wilderness. And He Himself said, The Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against Him. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against Him. Church, it's a blessing to know a God who knows how not only to cleanse and purify us, but also to destroy our spiritual foes and to deal even with our personal adversaries. Let me close. Our God is a consuming fire. And the Lord shall judge His people. If you and I would only realize what those tremendous words mean, our God is a consuming fire. We would feel so sorry for the person that's wronged us that we would wish them no evil, but we would tremble at the thought of their judgment. We would fall down on our face and knees and plead with God to have mercy on them. Church, let us this morning pass through this flame and sword without a reservation. I don't know what He's dealt with with you about. In the deepest cry, the most difficult hour of the trial that I came through, coming out of a horrible seizure, when I come to, I don't know how long I didn't know anybody or anything, where I was at. My wife said she stood and looked at me, stared at me, said stuff to me. I never even responded. When everything come back, the Holy Ghost was right there. He said, Son, call the people that did you wrong and forgive them and tell them you forgive them. I said, What? I'm telling you. I couldn't believe. I told my wife. I said, I got a call. So and so, so and so. What? They like to tore the church apart. They tore you apart. You're what? I said, God said to do it. I went in and called. The first person I called said to me, my God, is this Brother Downs? I've lived with a dam blocking my spiritual life since four years ago. And when I heard your voice, a breakthrough came. I feel God has come through this. It would look better if they'd have come to me. 
It would have looked better if God would have judged them and punished them. It would have looked better for me. But it wouldn't have looked better for him. I would have been vindicated. People would have said, yes, he's a man of God. How dare him touch him? No, sir. You call. You ask him to forgive you for any wrong. Because in well-meaning things you say or do, sometimes we hurt. And we don't even know we did it. You do that. I did it. The glory of God came down in that room. Our God is a consuming fire. Let that sword of the Spirit, let Him stop and refine us. There's things some of you have held on to for years. The minute a conversation of a certain church comes up, you begin the gossip about what happened in that church 10 years ago, 20 years ago. God wants you to be free from that. He wants to loose you from that once and for all. It's not what they face or don't face, what they go through or don't go through. God wants to free you. Can I tell you, there's nothing like this river flowing. And when you need the Holy Ghost, when you need the grace of God, it's there instantly. When you need, His, need Him, you say, Jesus, and heaven stands to attention because there's not all the trash. He's got to plead and push and press through. I'm telling you, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword dividing of soul, spirit, joints, moral, thoughts, intents of the heart. He knows everything. And in this camp meeting, in this opening service, as Malachi prophesied 400 years before he got here, said when he comes, he'll set as a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. That soap, brother, is just cleansing the outside. That fire moves into the inside. He gets where we don't know things are at. People we've said, things we've done. You talk about free. There's nothing like being free by the Spirit of the living God. Would you stand?